always like to, to start before I, I share with a little story, and usually it's a story that happened to me. And uh, I got to tell you, I had something happen on Friday that, uh, that was, it was humorous, but it was also, it was, it was timely when, when, when we get into the message today. So every Friday, I go up to uh, Washington, D.C. for work, and uh, I drive the train up. So I leave Richmond at 7 o'clock in the train. The train gets to Washington, D.C. Union Station at 9.33. And I run over a few blocks away to my one meeting. And then I have another meeting at another building that I have to take a taxi or an Uber car to. So how many of you ever heard of Uber? Yes. Uber. Yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing. So you, take this, you download this app called Uber. And you walk outside of the building you're at. And you summons a complete stranger to come pick you up. And then you do everything your parents told you not to do. You get in the car, the back seat of a stranger <laughs> who you've never seen before. They know your name. You know their name. It's quite awkward. Are you Charles? Are you Amir? Yes. <laughs> and, and then they take you to the location, and you promptly exit their car. And you never see them again. You never touch them. You never give them any money. It all is done through the application. It's a really an amazing thing. So, um, so I, I went from my, my one meeting to my second meeting. Now, my train leaves Union Station at 3.55 sharp. Okay? And, no, you know, what well, we, we heard about trains this morning. Jesus' love is like a freight train. Well, that's good. That's good. But I think that I would rather sing Jesus' love is like a Japanese bullet train. Because I've seen them freight trains, and they're kind of slow. You may not be able to stop them, but they're slow, almost as slow as the Amtrak train. So, so I'm, in my, my, I'm in my last meeting, and it's only four miles from my meeting back to Union Station. And I said, I'm, gonna, I'm in D.C. I'm going to allow myself 25 minutes. I'll be fine. So I, I finish, walk outside. I summons my stranger chariot, comes up and says that I forget the gentleman's name. It was coming to pick me up. None of, none of which are uh, people that, that uh, are from the United States. They're all foreign. Uh, but at any rate, he picks me up, and uh, we start heading back to Virginia Station. And we get halfway there, and I can't get any, he can't go anymore. Traffic is crazy. And I'm looking at my, my phone. I got my GPS on, and it says, you will arrive at Union Station at 3.56. And I'm like, the train will already be gone, and I still have to run downstairs at this rate. And he says, I don't know where all these people are here, all these people everywhere. And so uh, we get uh, 0.4 miles from Union Station. I can see it. It's about six football fields away. I can see the entrance of Union Station. And he's sitting in traffic. And I've got six minutes. And I said, you know what? When I was in high school, I could run the mile. <laughs> I ran the mile in 8.1 or 8.2 you know, not even trying. And then one time I ran in like 7.15 and, you know, I said, I can do this. I'm maybe 43, but I can do this. I said, <laughs> I said, let me out here. I don't know what all these people are here for, but I'm going to Union Station. So I take my backpack that I've got, my jacket, my lunch, my laptop and everything in, and I started hoofing it. I'm like, here's this crazy man running shirt. You know, I got dress shirt on, pants, I'm running closer I get, man, it's like a homeschool convention. There are kids everywhere. There are parents everywhere. People are running around with big banners. I'm darting through these people. I'm running. I'm running. Now I'm breathing heavy. I'm panting. I'm like, Lord, help me. I got to get, I got to get to that train. The grandma's walking out in front of me, kids. I was like, what in the world? I'm darting in and out of people, buses. <laughs> I get in Union Station, and it's worse. I can't barely see a path to go. I'm hunkered down. <laughs> I get down to the gate. There's nobody at the gate. Lord, I haven't even looked at my phone, but it's like 3.54. And I burst through the gate, and I said, train 125. They said, down there. And I start going down. The guy says, no, 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 not down there, over there. He said, no, no, I'm just messing with you. I said, don't do that. Run down. Run down. There's no conductor standing outside of the train. 
I get halfway down the train. I'm looking. I see the steps down. And the guy goes, man, slow down. They haven't even hooked up the diesel yet. I go in. I collapse in a chair. And ten minutes later, they, we take off. We depart. Get back to Richmond. So I'm thinking all the way back. I was like, what were all those people doing at D.C.? And I start looking on my social media feed, and I see the, the annual March for Life. I said, I was there. I, I told Beverly, I was like, I was at the March for Life in Washington, D.C. I said, look at the coverage. If you see a five foot ten white guy with a backpack, Darting in and out of kids, trying to run over grandma. That was me. I was, I was there. If I would have known I was at the March for Life, what would, I would have, I would have changed my train ticket to the next train that left 45 minutes later, and I would have marched for life. Hallelujah. I've always wanted to go to the March for Life. And I went to the March for Life. I didn't march for life. I ran for life. I was running for life. Thank you, Jesus. And you know what? I just thank the Lord I had a small part. I was raising awareness. I was clearing a path. Thank you, Jesus. Let's bow our heads. Lord, help us. Help us not to miss the march for life. Lord, help us not to miss the moment that you have us in because of our agenda and because of our schedule and because of what we have to do, Lord, and our plans. Help us not to miss you, Jesus, in this moment. Visit us, Lord. You've already visited us this morning. Be with us as we share your word, as we talk about your word, as we think about the great things that you have done. In Jesus' name. Turn in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 24. I love Joshua. How many of you guys love Joshua? I love Joshua. You know why? Because Joshua was a warrior. He was a general. Joshua was the leader of the special forces, Joshua and Caleb, special forces of Israel. And you guys know the story. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. Come on, Jericho. Jericho, hey, Josh fought the battle of Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down. That's right, y'all are good. So Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, but he fought a lot of other battles too. All right, now in Joshua chapter 24, Joshua is done fighting battles. This is his final address. He gathers together all of Israel, and I'm going to go ahead and read the whole chapter because we're going to cover the whole chapter this morning. i got three hours. Pastor's not here. And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel together at Shechem, say Shechem, Shechem. and called the elders of Israel for their heads and for their judges and their officers, and they presented themselves before the Lord. Now let me, let me paint the picture. Here's how, it, here's how it happens. You come and at the morning, in the morning, uh, Ricky, what's it called? When you present yourself in the morning, you fall in, right? So you fall in and you present yourself. Kids in cap, you know what I'm talking about too. You got to stand out there in the sweat dripping down your face in the sun, standing at attention until the commanding officer says otherwise. So, until he says the words that you all guys wait for, what's the words? At ease. At ease. All right. So you present themselves, all the elders, everybody lines up in front of Joshua, and they're presenting themselves before the Lord. So they present themselves before the Lord, and Joshua said to all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers that dwelt on the other side of the flood time, of old time, your father Abraham, they served other gods. I'm going to abbreviate some of this. I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood. I led him through the land of Canaan, multiplied his seed, gave him Isaac, You know, Isaac had Jacob and Esau, and then I sent the the children of Jacob into Egypt. I sent Moses and Aaron. I plagued Egypt. I brought them out of Egypt. 
I destroyed the Egyptians in the Red Sea and the chariots and the horsemen. And when the children of Israel that cried unto the Lord, I put darkness between them and Egypt, the Egyptians. Then I brought you into the land of the Amorites after you'd been in the wilderness for a long season. And when you were in the land of the Amorites, I fought for you. I gave you the land that you might have a possession. I destroyed them from before you. And then Balak, the son of Zippor, the king of Moab, he arose and warred against you. And he called for the prophet Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I wouldn't listen to Balaam. And I blessed you instead. And I delivered you out of his hands. You went to Jordan and came to Jericho. And the men of Jericho fought against you. The Amorites and the Pizzaites and the Canaanites and the Hittites. And all the other ites and the Jebusites. And I delivered them into your hand. And the, and the Bible says that I sent hornet before you. And, and earlier in, in Genesis it says I will send hornets before you to drive out the kings of the Amorites, so you don't even have to use a sword or a bow. God has secret weapons. To tell you, the best infantry in the world cannot stand against hornets. There's no defense. God knows. And guess what else they can't stand against? Hailstones. We learned a couple weeks ago that God has reserved in the snow, He's reserved hailstones against the Day of Judgment. So God has, a, God has a whole arsenal of bees and hornets and flies and frogs, all kinds of stuff. It's like Jumanji, right? So I sent the hornets to drive these, your enemies out. I've given you a land which you did not labor and cities that you built not. You dwell in them, vineyards and olive yards that you didn't plant, but you get to eat. Now, therefore... Because of all the things that God has done for you guys, all right? So he's, he's got some history. He's reciting all the things that God's done for your family, your forefathers. Because of all this, says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve Him with sincerity and truth and put away the gods of your fathers that served on the other side of the flood in Egypt and serve you the Lord. If it seems right, if it seems evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods of your fathers that served on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell now. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people answered and said, God forbid we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God, it is He that brought us out brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, and did those great signs in our sight and preserved us all in the way that we went among all the people whom we have passed. And the Lord drove out before the people, the Amorites, which dwelt in the land. Therefore, we also serve the Lord, for he is our God. And Joshua said to the people, listen to this, ye cannot serve the Lord. For he is a holy God, he is a jealous God, and he will not forgive your transition, transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do hurt and consume you. After that, he had done you good. And the people said, Nay, but we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said, Your witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, we are witnesses. Now, put away the strange gods that are among you and incline your heart to the Lord God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, the Lord God we will serve and his voice we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and set them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. Say Shechem. Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God and took a great stone and set it under an oak tree that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to all the people, look at this stone. Behold this stone. Look at this stone. Behold, this stone shall be a witness unto us. For it, the stone, hath heard all the words of the Lord which spake 
he spake unto us, and it shall therefore be a witness unto you, lest you deny the Lord your God. So Joshua let the people depart, every man to his inheritance. And it came to pass after these things that Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being a hundred and ten years old. Skipping down a couple of verses. And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua, which had known the Lord and known the works of the Lord he had done for Israel. That was Joshua's final speech. It was more than just a final speech to the children of Israel. It was his departing words from a, from a man who had led them from when they came out of the wilderness through every battle. He had seen the works of the Lord. He'd seen God do all these amazing things. But he knew human nature and he knew that we, left to our own selves, are not faithful. How many of y'all are faithful? Faithful? No, we are not faithful. Don't raise your hand up. You're not faithful. It's a trick question. And he had to put a challenge. And God puts people in our lives to challenge us. How many of y'all have ever been challenged in your life by somebody? Challenged. That may have been your Sunday school teacher. It may have been your mother. It may have been your father. May have been your sister, your brother, somebody. It could have been a teacher, a school teacher at school. But God puts people in our lives to challenge us. To see what we're made of. And Joshua gave them a challenge. He said, choose you this day who you will serve. So just to recap. Verses 1 through 14, Joshua reminds Israel of all the mighty things God did for them. We have to remember the things that God does for us. And you know what? We have to rehearse the things that God did for us. If not, our children aren't going to know. God has done some great things for you, but if you don't open your mouth and tell somebody about them, it's like they never happened. Open your mouth. Rehearse the wonderful things that God has done. And that's the, Sister Bennett, she shared this last week. When you start getting down on yourself, when you start feeling, oh, woe is me, start reminding yourself of all the things that God has done for you. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful for what God has done. Now, God brought them through the Red Sea. He fought for them supernaturally. He wouldn't let Balaam a prophet put a curse on them. You know what? People can't put a curse on a child of God, but we as children of God can open up ourselves to be cursed. But God is not going to let somebody maliciously put a curse on you. And Balaam wasn't able to do that. He tried and tried and tried to curse the children of Israel, but he couldn't. Finally, he said, I can't curse these people. Every time I try to curse them, I open my mouth and all I get is blessing coming out. But I can tell you how they can curse themselves. And that's what's called the, the doctrine of Balaam. Now who can tell me how, what he told them? What was the strategy? The strategy on how they could curse themselves. What did they have to do? They just had to start following after other gods. Because God is a jealous God. And so the best way to do that is to attack the weakness of the men. Amen. Amen. Men have two weaknesses. Yeah. What's the weaknesses of a man? Women, Women and food. That's right. <laughs> you can give a man... You can bribe a man with women and food faster than anything else. If I was hungry and you set a million dollars in front of me in cold cash and you sent a Papa John's pizza the works right beside it and said choose you this day what you shall have I would eat the Papa John's pizza depending on how hungry I was 
So the doctrine of Balaam was send the women, send your daughters, your beautiful daughters, down there just to flirt with those boys. And when they're so emotionally involved with them and they care about them, then they can bring their little idols with them and draw their hearts away from the Lord. And then you won't even have to curse them because God will take care of them. That was the doctrine of Balaam. But God rewarded them, the children of Israel. He gave them cities that they didn't have to build, vineyards that they didn't, olive yards they didn't have to, to plant. And we look, look at verse uh, 14 and 15. Because of all this, all everything that God has done for you, here's the challenge. Fear the Lord. Serve Him with sincerity and truth. Put away the gods and choose you this day who you will serve. Let's talk about that for a few minutes. Young people, old people, little people, tall people, short people, fat people, skinny people. Choose. You have to choose. You cannot serve the Lord because mom and daddy did. You have got to choose. You have to make a choice. Your life is nothing but a series of choices. And, I, and I'm challenging you. I will challenge before we leave here today. Everybody's going to be challenged again. Choose you today, this day, who you will serve. The Holy Spirit will draw you. But you have free will and you must choose. God never forces anyone to do anything they're not willing to do. But He has means to make you willing to do stuff too. But He will not go against your will. The Holy Spirit is described as a dove. Gentle, beautiful, but a I have never been accosted by a dove. I've never feared for my life because of a dove. Raven, different story. I see a raven getting too close to me, I'm going for cover. Blue jay, mocking jay, you better run. But a dove is gentle. And the Holy Spirit is gentle. He's going to draw you, he's going to woo you, but he's not going to force you to do something against your will. God already has angels that have to obey Him. When He created man, it's because He wanted to have a relationship with someone that wanted to be with Him. Somebody that loved Him because of who He was, not because of what He could give Him. Isn't that what we all want? Don't we all want to be loved for who we are? Isn't that what we're searching for as young people in relationships? God put that desire in your heart. So God has a way of making us willing. The people cry out, in verse 16 through 18, they cry out and they say, God forbid, we will serve the Lord. In verse 18, Joshua, he busts their bubble. He says, you can't serve the Lord. You can't even do it. And he was right. Because in our own strength, we cannot. We can, we can make the decision. We choose to serve the Lord. But in our own strength, and our own power, we cannot. We fall so short every single time. In our own strength. Look at John chapter 1, verse 12. Jesus said, To as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. We have to have the power of God even to serve the Lord. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 through 6, God desires that all men should be saved. Through the mediation between God and man, the one mediator, Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. But it's, it's through him 
It's not through me. It's not just, I can't just will to serve the Lord. I can't by my own strength serve the Lord. In 2 Peter 3 verse 9, the Bible tells us that God is not slack concerning His promises, but He's long-suffering towards us. He's not willing that any should perish, but He wants all to come to repentance. In Revelation 22 verse 17, the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, all he that is athirst, and drink of the water of life freely. Come. So Joshua warns the people in verse 20 not to forsake the Lord and serve Him. Not to serve other gods. Don't forsake the Lord and serve other gods. When we go for, astray from God in His mercy, though, He always corrects us chastises he brings us back you know that if there are neighbors kids coming over and playing at our house or in our yard with my son jack i will correct my son jack before i will say anything to those other children and if you're feeling the correction of the lord in your life know that he's correcting you because you're his child Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 through 11. Hebrews 12. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, or correcteth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth receiveth. If you endure the correction or chasten the Lord, God dealeth with you as his sons. For what son is he whom the father chaseth not? Or what father wouldn't correct his own son? But if you're without correction, then you're all are partakers are then you're bastards and not sons. You're not a child of God if he's not correcting you. Furthermore, we have fathers in our flesh that correct us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much more rather be subjection to our fathers of spirits and live? For verily, for a few days chasteneth us after their own pleasure, pleasure, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. So we're corrected a, a little while, but it's for our benefit. So we can be partakers of the holiness of God. Now, no correction or chastening for the present seems joyous. Let me tell you something. When you're getting corrected, it don't seem good. It seems bad. But afterward, it yieldeth a peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. We don't like to be corrected. The Bible says in another verse that I didn't write down, he that being often reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall be cut off suddenly. And the way that you respond to the correction of the Lord, think about it the same way that your children respond to your correction. You can see the ones, when you start the correction, you can see the spirit of the child be repentant and be humble and accept the correction, and you know that things are going to be right, and they're going to be better, and you can tell the ones that are just like, okay, okay, all right, you said your piece. Let's stop talking about it. Those, the Bible says, harden their neck, be cut off suddenly. It's just like the little lamb. I want to get some lambs. How many of y'all like lambs? It's just like the little lamb. The one little lamb that keeps wandering off, the shepherd loves him so much. He keeps leaving the 99. He finds him. The first time he gets him, he's like, you're such a cute little rebellious lamb. You come back over here. <laughs> Second time he says, oh, I'm warning you. I may have to do a little bit more correction on you, but because I love you, I'm going to correct you. Come on back. Third time he says, I've got this nice little staff here. 
and I'm going to give you some correction. I think you and I need to be close. Just like when the teacher said, Jack, you need to come sit here at the front of the class right here so I can keep my eye on you, right? So I'm going to take this staff and I'm going to, oh, what's that? What's that over there? Look over there. Crack. Ah! You broke my leg. That's because I want to carry you. Me and you are going to get to know each other real well while your leg heals. How many of y'all have ever been staffed by the Lord? That's because he loves you and you're not a bastard. Thank the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When God corrects you like that, he's drawing you close. You're going to spend a lot more time with the shepherd real close. Because the shepherd would have to carry him. Carry that little sheep all, all around. But guess what? When that leg healed, that sheep was right there. He didn't run away again. So that was part of the warning that, that Joshua gave to the children of Israel. He said that God's going to correct you. We love you. Because we're children. Now, here are some reasons why God corrects us. In Job 33, when we refuse to hear the voice of the Lord, refuse to listen to him, that causes correction to come in our lives. In Samuel 7, verse 14, 2 Samuel 7, verse, verse 14, when we commit iniquity before the Lord, he comes and corrects us. Psalms 6, verse 1 and 38, verse 1, when we provoke the Lord, not just commit iniquity, we provoke the Lord. He brings correction. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 32, and we, we read this almost every week with communion. When we don't judge ourselves, we're judged by the Lord. In Deuteronomy 11, verses 2 through 6, when we stubbornly rebel against the Lord like that little sheep, and we just do our own thing. I know the Bible says I'm not supposed to do that, but... Everybody else is doing it, but it feels good, but whatever. When we stubbornly rebel, and when we sow to the flesh, Galatians 6, verses 7 through 8. Finally, sometimes we just need general correction. Hebrews, 11, or Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 10, and and Peter 3, verse 19, just general correction. Because God, God what, what is God interested in? Is God interested in you being happy right now? Everybody raise your hand if you think God's interested in you being happy right now. Hallelujah. Trick question, Jilly. <laughs> God is not interested. There is no promise in the Bible that says, therefore thou shalt have happiness. It ain't in there. Look. I've read this one, I've read this Bible four times. It's about to fall apart. It's not in there. What would you say? Hezekiah 3 verse 6? No. God promises us joy in his presence, his fullness of joy. And you can, you can have joy in your heart when you're not happy. Happy is a temporary emotion. Joy is a state of mind. And you get joy from thankfulness. Jesus Others than you. That's the way to spell joy. We get our joy in the Lord, but it's not meaning that we're happy right now. So general correction. God knows how to correct us. And he's trying to make us a bride for him. He wants to make us the pure bride so we can spend eternity with him in heaven. I didn't write this scripture down, but it comes to mind right now that the Bible says some he saves by blessing and other he saves by fire, pulling them out. And I've had to pray this tough prayer for all my kids. And if you have kids, you need to pray this prayer too. Let me tell you how the prayer goes. Jesus, this is John. 
I have children. You gave me these children, Lord, to take care of. I'm doing the best I can, but I need your help. I want to see them in heaven with me. Whatever you got to do to get them in heaven, Jesus. Wreck their car. <laughs> maim them. Whatever it takes. It's a tough prayer to pray. But if we believe in a heaven, and if we believe in a hell, you got to choose this day who you will serve. Either you believe or you don't believe. And if you believe in a heaven that's so important that we go to, and you believe in a hell that's so real that people are going to burn for eternity, then you can pray that prayer in love. Lord, if you got to maim them, take away any potential they want, get them into heaven, whatever it takes. Get them into heaven. I do not want to be in heaven worshiping the Lord, saying, I will dance around your throne, saying, I wish that this child was with me, but they didn't make it. So I prayed that prayer. I prayed it a lot. And the older my kids get, I pray it more. Whatever it takes, Lord, get Charlie into heaven. Whatever it takes. I'm not joking. I pray it. And then I stand back and I, and I, I say, Lord... You deal with them. I can't watch them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You take care of them. And then sometimes the Lord chastens them. And when he chastens them, I'm there to thank you, Jesus. Pray and help them. So God knows how to correct us. He knows how to correct you, and he does it because he loves you. That's what Joshua was telling the children of Israel. He was like, you say you're going to serve him. Verse 21, the people said, Nay, we will serve the Lord. Joshua tells them, All right, you're a witness against yourself. Remember what we learned a few weeks back when I spoke last in Matthew 12, 36 through 37? Every idle word you will give an account for. By thy word thou shalt be justified, and by thy word thou shalt be condemned. Romans 10, 9, 10, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So, Joshua tells the people, your words are witnesses against you. You said you're going to serve the Lord. And nobody can get saved until they make that confession. I confess that Jesus is Lord. I believe in my heart God raised him from the dead. When you make that confession of faith, you believe it in your heart, by those words, you're going to be justified, and by those words, you're going to be condemned. Because at that point, you have to live your life either under the lordship of Jesus Christ, or you have to reject the Lord and go after and serve other gods. And by your words, you'll be justified, and by your words, you'll be condemned. Verse 23, Joshua tells them again, put away your strange gods. Listen to the voice of the Lord and incline your heart to the God of Israel. Proverbs 23, verse 26. My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. Jesus reminded the um, Pharisees and the Sadducees in Matthew 15, verse 8. He says, Isaiah was correct when he prophesied of this people. They draw nigh to me with their lips. They honor me with their words, but their heart is far from me. So Joshua said, he said, you need to take not only and say the words, but incline your heart. Incline your heart towards the God of Israel. Verse 24, for the third time the people said, Our God, we will serve, His voice, we will obey. 
the people committed to obey his voice. How many times did Peter deny Jesus? Joshua challenged them three times and said, will you serve the Lord? Yes, we will serve the Lord. You can't serve the Lord without his help. Okay, but we'll serve the Lord. We'll listen to him. You won't listen to him. If you do, if you, if you don't, God's going to judge you. He's going to correct you because he loves you. We will serve the Lord. Three times they confirmed. Verse 25, Joshua makes a covenant. It's like a contract with the people. He wrote it all down in the book of the law. And then he does something interesting. And when I read this, it's like a light bulb went off. He takes a great stone and sets it under the oak tree. Verse 26. Let's read that again. Joshua wrote all these words in the book of the law and took a great stone and set it up under an oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. Joshua said to all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness unto us. For it, the stone, hath heard all the words of the Lord, which he spake unto us, and it shall therefore be a witness unto you, lest you deny your God. The stone heard all the words of the Lord. The stone heard the people say three times, We're going to serve the Lord. We're going to serve the Lord. And Joshua says, this big stone I just rolled over here, this is a witness against you. This big stone. And the Lord brought a couple of scriptures back to my, my mind. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 4, Paul says, that rock, that stone that followed them in the wilderness was Jesus. In Matthew 21, verse 42, Jesus tells the religious leaders, I am the stone that the builders rejected. Whoever falls on the stone will be broken, but whoever the stone falls on will be crushed to powder. In Luke chapter 19, verse 40, at Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the people saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And all the religious leaders, they come out and they say, tell the people to stop. Tell them to stop saying that. Jesus said, if they stop, then the rocks are going to cry out. How fitting it was that he put a stone and said, this stone has heard everything. And you know what that stone was? The stone was Jesus. And today, three times, those of you who are on the Lord's side are going to stand with me in the presence of the stone in the presence of Jesus. And we're going to say, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will incline our hearts to what He says. We will obey His voice. In verse 31, we see that Israel... Everyone who was there that day, they lived up to their part of the covenant. The Bible says that Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the, the days of the life of the elders who had seen all the works of the Lord. And because they had seen the works of the Lord and because of the challenge that they, they had from, from Joshua, they served the Lord. But in the next verse in Judges, we see that when the elders died, that had seen the great works of the Lord, that the people's heart were turned away to other gods. Our default, our default as humans is to turn away from the Lord. But the blood of Jesus Christ is efficacious. And God continued to woo and to draw them back. He did many corrections to them. He took them into bondage again, into Babylon. He took them into slavery. He let, he let the enemies around them come and take their land, and every time that the children of Israel would get in a bad situation, they would turn and they would call on the Lord. And when they called on the Lord, He would come back to them. And you know what? If you see yourself in a cycle, look at your life. Do you find yourself in a cycle of calling on the Lord, God moving in your life, blessings coming in, 
And then you find yourself back in trouble again, calling on the Lord again. Identify what happens in that cycle. Because God wants you drawing near to Him. And what happens is, if you look back, you'll see that when God blesses you and moves, you start slacking out of church. You stop praying and reading the Bible every day. You start falling away from the Lord because things are okay. I got this now, God. I'm good. I'm good. And left your own devices, you get yourself right back in the same mess that you were in before or something similar. And then you're like, oh, God, why is everything going wrong? Help me. And in his mercy, he comes back and he helps you again. But we need to be the child who learns and says, yeah, I'm not going to do that again. And we need to hide God's word in our hearts so what? We won't sin against God. One of the reasons why we get correction is because of our iniquity and our stubborn rebellion against the Lord. So church, in closing today, I'm going to ask you the same question that Joshua asked the children of Israel. But be careful how you answer. Because just like Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said, you people... You draw an eye to me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. So here's the question. If it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your father, and I'm going to change it and say whether the gods of this world, whether the gods of money, whether the gods of fame, whether gods of technology, whether gods of whatever, you fill in the blank, whatever is between you and the Lord, whatever keeps you from serving the Lord, are you going to serve those gods or are you going to stand and serve the Lord? So I ask you, stand. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Stand with me right where you're at. If you say, I choose to serve the Lord. And here's what I want you to say. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You can't serve the Lord. Say, because of Jesus... I can serve the Lord. Lord. If you forsake the Lord, he's going to come against you big time. Will you serve the Lord? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Are you just drawing nigh to the Lord with your lips? Are you just honoring him with your words? Is your heart far from him? Is your heart already down there at Bojangles getting some chicken right now? Your words are witnesses against you. You're standing in the presence of this great stone, Jesus, the rock of our salvation. Say it one more time. Actually, just pretend like Jesus is standing right here to my right. Look at him and say, as for me and my house, we will serve you. As for me and my house, Jesus, we will serve you. Do whatever it takes to keep us straight, Lord. Bow our heads and pray. Lord, these people have stood before you today, the rock. They're falling on the rock, Lord. They're falling on you. That you'll break us, break us of our will, break us of our urges for sin, Lord. Draw us close to you, Jesus. Help us to serve you not only with our lips, but with our heart. Lord, as for me and my house, we will serve you. Jesus' name. I give you all my plans, all my thoughts, all my dreams, all my hopes, all my wishes. Just talk to the Lord right now. Talk to Him. Commit to serve you, Lord. I must put aside my desire for money, for women, for whatever. Fill in the blanks. For drugs, for alcohol, pornography. Fill in the blanks. I won't serve these other gods. 
I'm going to serve you, Jesus. I'm going to put away these gods. With your help, you said as many as received me, re- received you to them gave you power to become the sons of God. Jesus, I need your power. I can't do it without you. And while these young people sing, if you need special prayer, come to the front. If not, just sing this song with us. And my sister Nett will close the service. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. slave to fear, a slave to sin, a slave to bondage. You are a child of God. Hallelujah. Sing it out. I'm no longer slave to fear. You don't have to be afraid. For I am a child of God. exactly what the Lord's put in my heart. Some of you love the Lord. Some of you are committed to the Lord, but you have never formally declared at this altar that Christ is your Lord. How many heard what I'm saying? Or you've never been to a place publicly and stepped out and say, I receive Jesus. You're just kind of like sliding in with the rest of us. But some of you need to make that proclamation today. Remember those days way back in the day when you heard them crying from the back door, falling to the front? Some of you need to make that public confession of your faith today. You love the Lord, but you've never publicly showed it. I want you to change your posture and come up to the front. Just do it right now. You've never, you've never, ever, ever come up and said, Lord, I receive you. And you know what? I know you love the Lord, but you've never testified. And when you come up to the front, you're testifying that Jesus is your Lord. I mean, let's close our eyes. This is a very serious sermon, and I just kept seeing this over and over and over and over because our society will dull sin down. Our society will will make you think, well, it doesn't matter. It's okay. God loves you. Yes, we know all of that. But at some point, we have to say, no, I am serving the Lord. The things that bothered me last year, they will not come my th- me this year because I am taking a stand. Who would say, Sister Bennett, I have never really formally made that stand that I'm a child of God. It's a hard stand to make. Can you make that stand? But everybody knows I'm a Christian. But yet when you're confronted on the workplace sometimes, it's hard. Hallelujah. Doesn't hurt to repeat. All right. It's almost like your marriage vows. Sometimes it doesn't hurt to repeat them. Hallelujah. I got, I'll tell you what, the Lord's speaking. And you say, Sister Bennett? Yes. I'm saying and I'm standing with Brother John and I agree. But I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to take it a step further. It's okay. Father, we just thank you right now for your Holy Spirit. I thank you that you infuse us with a hatred of the things that make you sad, Lord. 
there's about one or two more people in here that you've never once come up to the front and accepted Christ as your Savior, but you love the Lord, but you've never proclaimed, Lord, I'm tired of my way, and I accept you as my Savior. And I don't say it has to be this, this altar. It can be any altar, but you've never made a formal consecration, but you want to do it today. You want to be distinct. How many know what I'm saying? You want to stand out distinctly. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, I just thank you even this day. Lord, even as children we received you as our Savior and we walked and talked with you, but even this day we reaffirm that commitment in even a greater way, Father, that as for ourselves and our house, we will serve the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. There's other people here. Hallelujah. Oh, rabaranda rabasi, rabaranda rabasi, rabaranda rabasi. Say, thank you, Lord, that I'm your daughter. And I thank you the blessings of the Lord fall upon me and my house. And we will serve you all the days of our lives in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. There it is right now, Audrey. There, may there be a new blessing upon your entire household. Oh, there it is. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Touch every fiber of her body, her husband. Strengthen them. In Jesus' name. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Say, Lord, I thank you that this day I do even publicly reaffirm my commitment to you. I will serve you me and my household and I thank you for the blood of Jesus and that confirmation of your spirit that you're with me in Jesus name one of the hardest things that will be for young people to do is walk down and say guess what without Jesus I am dirty unclean and doomed as adults we try to come up with plans but I appreciate this sermon today. And I am not in any way trying to sidestep the group, everybody standing and, and, and saying these statements, we will serve the Lord. But I felt sometimes we just need individual calling out. And, and I leave it right there. Father, I just thank you for your word. I thank you for the ministry. I thank you for your anointing. And I thank you that this week you do lead us explicitly. I thank you for Didi that found her keys in the snow after two days when the plows had been through the work parking lot or wherever they were. And Lord, when she got back to the place right laying there where the keys that had been lost in the treasure of the snow, but you brought them to her. And I want to say thank you for your Holy Spirit that works miracles in our lives every single day and every single week in Jesus' mighty name. How many can say thank God? thank God? Now as you leave, we're doing a little bit something different. All the young people, guess where you're headed for your goodies? All young people, you're fellowshipping back there. All older people, I mean, we won't say it that way. I'll say the rest of you. God bless you. Next Sunday's fantastic. We, hold on one more minute. We do have Wednesday night. I'm compelled for one step further. To the as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. November the 1st, 2016, I made a dedication to my father. And I said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Yes, my children and my children's children, but my members. That the Holy Spirit dwells within here, this house. Consider 
that my eyes and my ears and my hands and my feet, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord differently this year. This is a house that's going to be a house of prayer. These are eyes that are not going to see the things that they used to see. These are ears that are not, These are part of the house where the Holy Spirit dwells. Can you consider that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's a little bit more, but it brings it home to Steve. Because as for me and my house, my hands are going to be dealing differently this year. My eyes are going to be seeing differently this year. And I'm going to dedicate these members, and you're a member, but these are members, to the Lord differently today. So that's what I felt. And take it for whatever it's worth. If it ministers or if it re-comes back to your recollection this week, you will find a newer dedication in the members of your body. Better to enter into heaven with what? Everything or one less of certain parts? Lord, do whatever it takes to get me in and my members and all that I can get in. But if I have to lose to this or that, that's fine. Because I want to see you in heaven, Father. So who would agree that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord? New dedication for the members of the body that the Lord has blessed you with. And some do not have the hands to touch. And some do not have the feet to walk or the legs to walk. So Lord, help us not take for granted any of these people, any of these members. I dedicate these to you differently today, Father, and this to you differently today, Father. In Jesus' name. The Holy Spirit will prompt you. And those that are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. How many can give a clap offering to the Lord? As we rejoice, we go out with singing and rejoicing. God bless you. Where goodness flows, there is a fountain. The drowned sorrows, there is an ocean. It's deeper than fear, the tide is rising, rising. There is a curse.